In this episode, we'll be covering the cardiovascular system examination. And as with most of our examinations, we're going to follow an organized approach, this time using look, listen, and feel that reflect inspection, auscultation, palpation, and percussion. Before beginning the exam itself, using the mnemonic WIPE, we can remember to wash our hands and wipe down any equipment, introduce ourselves to the patient and confirm their identity, then obtain permission to perform the exam, including roughly what it will entail, position the patient and appropriately expose them. In this case, that's lying supine at a 45 degree angle on a bed exposed to the waist, but exposing the legs as well is useful. Now for the exam itself. Inspection initially involves observing the patient generally and noting features such as age, objects such as oxygen, and do they appear unwell or to be in any distress, such as being short of breath. Other features to note include colour changes like cyanosis, jaundice, or extreme pallor. Also to be included here are the presence of any scars that may indicate previous surgeries like coronary artery bypass grafts, valve replacement, or even transplant. Dysmorphic features suggestive of Downs, Marfan's, or Turner's syndromes as examples should also be noted, as these syndromes often have associated cardiac pathologies. Then we move to inspect more specific portions. An easy way to do this is moving from top to bottom, beginning with the face and the neck. The eyes may demonstrate conjunctival pallor that suggests anemia or poor perfusion. Hyperlipidemia may also be suggested by corneal arcus that are white or grey rings in the periphery of the cornea, formed by cholesterol deposits. Presence of xanthelasma that are yellow plaques found periorbitally also indicate hyperlipidemia. Malar flush is associated with mitral stenosis and the mouth can be cyanosed. In particular, this can be seen underneath the tongue. A high palate in the mouth is seen in Marfan syndrome, and Muller's sign, where there is systolic pulsating of the uvula, is associated with aortic regurgitation. Rhythmic head bobbing, called Demuset's sign, can be visible, and is also associated with aortic regurgitation. The neck can demonstrate the jugular venous pressure, or JVP, by asking the patient to rotate their head to look to the left and observing for the pulsations of the internal jugular vein, usually located over the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Levels 4 cm or above from the sternal angle would be considered elevated, and remember that interpretation is based on the patient position. Changing the position can change the JVP. Causes of it being elevated can be remembered with the mnemonic PQRST for pulmonary hypertension and embolism, quantity of fluid to remember fluid overload, right ventricular failure, superior vena cava obstruction, and tricuspid regurgitation, stenosis, or cardiac tamponade, including pericardial effusion and constrictive pericarditis. The carotid pulse, coming from the common carotid arteries, can be distinguished from the JVP as the JVP will have pulsations but is not typically palpable, but can be occluded by finger pressure. The carotid pulse doesn't vary much with respiration, whereas inspiration causes the JVP to fall as the reduced thoracic pressure increases venous return, and there is typically a double waveform of the JVP for each arterial pulse. Now moving down to the trunk, closer inspection can reveal devices such as pacemakers or implantable cardiac defibrillators, typically under the left clavicle. Deformities of the chest, like pectus excavatum or pectus carinatum, can also be seen and are relevant as, for example, pectus excavatum can compress the heart and displace the apex beat. The apex beat itself may be visible, but more on this later. In cases of superior vena cava obstruction, there can be prominent veins visible on the chest, and I also include inspecting the abdomen here for any evidence of a pulsating mass that could indicate an abdominal aortic aneurysm. Inspecting the limbs, starting with the hands, we may see peripheral cyanosis, 
that can indicate poor peripheral perfusion, the presence of clubbing, which is a swelling of the distal phalanx of the fingers, shown by a loss of Shamroth's window, can suggest a wide range of pathologies, including respiratory and cardiac disorders, with congenital cyanotic heart disease, infective endocarditis, and atrial myxoma as cardiac examples. The nails can demonstrate splinter hemorrhages indicative of infective endocarditis and Quinky's pulsation caused by aortic regurgitation where there is visible capillary pulsating underneath the nail. Osler's nodes and Janeway lesions are typically found on the hands, more specifically Osler's nodes being painful purple nodules on the pulps of the fingers, that is the fleshy distal portion, while Janeway lesions are pain-free macules typically on the palms. Presence of peripheral edema is a sign that will cover more in palpation, but can be visible on inspection. This is generally best seen at the level of the ankle and foreleg, and inspecting the legs may also reveal scars, indicating previous harvesting of the saphenous vein as part of bypass surgery. Now we move on to auscultation. There's a dedicated episode on the channel to heart murmurs, but normal heart sounds typically include S1 and S2, reflecting the closure of the atrioventricular valves and semilunar valves, that is, the mitral and tricuspid and the aortic and pulmonary valves respectively. This means between S1 and S2 is systole, with S1 marking the beginning and S2 marking the end of it. Sounds other than these are considered additional sounds, which may be pathological or non-pathological in nature. I'll leave a link to the dedicated episode. But in general, the heart is auscultated in five primary areas, typically while simultaneously palpating the radial pulse. The aortic region is in the second intercostal space on the right sternal edge, and the pulmonary valve is best heard in the second intercostal space on the left sternal edge. Herb's point is on the left sternal edge at the third intercostal space, where S1 and S2 can normally both be heard, and the tricuspid valve is best heard in the fourth intercostal space on the left sternal edge. The mitral valve at the fifth intercostal space at the mid-clavicular line is also termed the apex. In children particularly, the interscapular region is also auscultated, particularly looking for the machine-like murmur of aortic coarctation. Additional areas of auscultation include the carotids for evidence of brewery that could indicate stenosis or radiation of a systolic murmur that may indicate aortic stenosis. The periumbilical region may reveal a murmur from renal artery stenosis which is a potential cause for secondary hypertension. Auscultate the lungs in particular, looking for the presence of bilateral fine basal crackles that can indicate pulmonary edema. And wheezing is another finding that may be heard in severe cases. Following our theme of working our way down, palpation in the cardiovascular exam involves palpating the trunk, feeling for the apex beat that is normally approximately at the fifth intercostal space at the mid-clavicular line, and feeling for the presence of any heaves or thrills that are a palpable vibration from forceful ventricular contractions or from heart murmurs, respectively. Linked to inspection, pressure may be applied to the right upper quadrant, causing increased venous return through the inferior vena cava, leading to a rise in jugular venous pressure. If this is a sustained rise, it may indicate right ventricular failure, whereas a normally functioning heart should be able to eject the increased return. Radial pulses should also be felt, feeling for the rhythm and the rate, as well as comparing radial pulses for any differences or delays indicating aortic dissection, or radial to femoral delay that can indicate aortic coarctation. From here, brachial and carotid pulses are next, with carotid in particular being assessed for bounding, and volume, for example large volume pulses associated with aortic regurgitation or small volume with aortic stenosis. Capillary refill time is checked by pressing the tip of the finger for 5 seconds, then observing how long it takes for the colour to return, with normal being around 2 seconds. 
To assess for peripheral edema, pressure is applied for 10 seconds, typically at the anterior tibia, before feeling for an indentation left behind, indicating pitting peripheral edema. Similar findings are tested at the hips and sacrum, especially in patients that are bedbound. Bear in mind, although this is a systematic approach, often different parts of the exam will be done simultaneously. To complete the examination, thank the patient and ask them to dress, wash your hands again and summarise your findings. Part of the next steps may include blood pressure measurements, a 12 lead ECG, fundoscopy looking for papilledema or Roth spots and a urine dip looking for hematuria or proteinuria.